So welcome back to the Bora Breakdown podcast with Johnny Dinner and Tom. We are the Bora podcast that gives you the ins, the outs, the ups and downs of Middlesbrough Football Club. Um, and this week, we're delighted to be joined by a player who's played over 230 games professionally in England, Scotland, India. He's represented England and captain England for under-20s as well. And now he's a UEFA licensed coach um, in Scotland. I'm delighted to be joined by the extremely talented Josh Walker. Josh, welcome to the Bora Breakdown podcast. How are you doing? Hey guys, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, mate, it's, um, I'm thrilled to have you on, to be honest. I think your career is uh, a really good story to tell. Um, and on this podcast, we're going to take you back down to memory lane, mate. And yeah. we're going to start right at the very beginning. You're a youngster with your mates, you're playing for your local team. How was your fine playing football growing up? Was it, and how was it, how was it when, you, when you started? Was it something you've always wanted to do? And how did you become aware of interest in teams that were wanting to sign you at such a young age? Uh, I kind of started um, because of my dad, really. My dad was a professional footballer up until he was about 21. And then he dropped out and he, jo- he started becoming part-time footballer as well as a fireman. And so he would always play on a Saturday. Um, be travelling here, there and everywhere for your part-time teams. And it was it was that, really. I got thrown in the back of the car, me and my brother, to, to, <laughs> taken to watch him play and stuff like that. And... We'd, we'd get to go on the pitches and that at half time and things like that. And mm. I just remember being like five, six year old and just loving kicking the ball in the net and just, just kicking the ball around. And it, it was from that really watching my dad play. And then from then, that on, from then on, sorry, it was just, I, was, I had a ball at me for till I was about 16 and left school. Do you know what I mean? It was just one of them mm. things. I just yeah. was obsessed by footy. Um, I then, it was about seven, eight year old. Um, we started playing like seven aside football, like actually for a team, yeah. a Killingworth Boys Club. Um, and it was a league that had just been started on a, like on a Sunday. So it was actually our first game in and we, we hammered this team wall bottle. They were called 12 nil. Um, I think I got five or six and another lad, Ben Richardson, got five or six as well. We, we split it between us. And after that game, a Middlesbrough scout uh, phoned me parents and, and asked for, for me and, well, obviously around Ben's parents as well, and asked the two of us to go down to Emmanuel College in Gateshead. It was a school of excellence at the time. Mm. It wasn't an academy. So we went down, and I was completely out of my depth, so out of my depth that, honestly, first session, um, there was a, the coach, Stan Nixon, fantastic coach that Middlesbrough had, unbelievable coach. And uh, me and Ben walked in, <clears throat> and you had all these players doing these tricks and turns I hadn't seen before and they're doing them numbered and it was, I, I just was like, oh, just totally blown away by it. I came away and I thought there's no way they're going to sign me. So anyway, six weeks later, got well, worked hard and progressed into the uh, School of Excellence, got offered like a two-year apprenticeship form type thing. Yeah. Um, and then while we were in there, it became an academy. Um, so I think it was 10-year-old when Middlesbrough became turned into an academy and then yeah. um that was that was pretty much how I got into it. Mm. You were saying there around that yeah people were schooling you in your first couple of sessions. So how did your how did you change and adapt as you were in the academy? Did you just did you find that your position changed quite quickly? How did you find getting the ball at your feet? How did you find working with those type of coaches as well? Honestly, I really, really struggled to begin with. Like really struggled. Mm. I mean I was always like at boys club level, I was probably like obviously stood out to yeah. be picked by Middlesbrough, but to then go into the academy where you've got all like players that have been there for maybe two, some of them have even been there two, three years, and they're only ten year old. Do you know what I mean? So they've been there from six, seven year old. They were just like robots, and I and I just yeah. thought no way. It was just I was I just had to work extremely hard. Do you know what I mean? It was. Mm. I just had to work and work and work to try and never mind overtake them, but just to try and compete with them. Um, and it was actually, I think I was about 11, 12 year old. No, I say about 11 or 12. And um, there was, I think I was actually about to get released. It was a, it was a real, real make or break moment in my career at, at Middlesbrough. There was a, <clears throat> a boys club, Walls End Boys Club who were renowned like in, in the northeast, who who wanted to sign us, but you weren't allowed anymore to play for an academy and a boys club. Yeah. And Middlesbrough had started playing me a year below. 
Um, so my days were pretty much numbered. Um, so my mum and dad decided, right, we're, we're going to pull them out and we'll, you can go to Wall's End. But because we kind of left Wall's End waiting for a while, Wall's End said, no, we don't want them. So I was actually, I found myself in a position um, where Wall's End didn't want us anymore. I was playing in a year below at Middlesbrough. I'd been struggling. I think it'd been confidence. It'd been a bit of everything. I just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't up to it. Do you know, like just completely, mm. I, I just couldn't get to the level. I felt I couldn't get to the level. And I remember my parents just saying, look, if it's your last game today for, for Borough, like just go and enjoy it. If it is the year below, just go and enjoy it. And then we'll see what happens from there. Um, so I went out, we played brilliant, scored a couple of goals. And after that, Middlesbrough then thought, oh, we're we'll, we'll moving back with his age group. And honestly, my career went from going down to just, then it was, it was non-stop, you know. It was just 12, 13-year-old, well, 13, I think I played in the under-17. So within the space of like mm. 18 months to two years, I'd gone from playing down in age to then playing three or four years above myself. So it was, the, the turnaround was dramatic. It was just, the self-belief just came and I, and I just, like I say, the hard work was, was incredible. I'd, I'd, I'd trained three nights a week. I'd come back every night after school. I was in the garden working my left foot, left foot, left foot until I, it, it became as good as my right. I would work on things like sprint stuff. I would just, it was relentless. I just was so determined to be a footballer. And that's that, that was kind of the turnaround for me. Yeah, it's I want to talk about this this turnaround quite a lot because there was an Adi, Adidas deal involved, you were playing three or four years above yourself, and you were saying there on self-belief. Um, was there anyone specific that helped instill that self-belief in you and gave you that confidence? Or would you just put that down to hard work and being pretty much possessed to to play at such a high standard? And I would suppose say the words the best word's probably relentless from from what yeah. you were saying there. You just seem so relentless to be a player. Is that where the self belief came from? It did. I mean, it it came from it pretty much came from my parents, and they were just like, "You're a good player. You wouldn't have been picked in the first." Mm. But probably the chat every parent has with their kids, you know, who yeah. are in an academy, go and enjoy it, go and make the most of that opportunity. And it just it was just from that moment, it was it just clicked into place and. I was not going to let anyone overtake us again. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was, it then became a bit of an obsession um, where I just thought that. Nah. So even like, I remember things on a Friday night. No, you'd come in from school and um, obviously I'd be playing, for, well, I'd be playing for the 17s. So it was like 13, 14 year old at this point. And you know what it's like at that age, teenage years, all your mates are going out and whatever. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even go and stand with them in the street. As soon as I left school, that was it. I was in the house and I was preparing for the next day. Like the professional in the professionalism that I had from a young age, when I look back, was was unbelievable. And I think that it was that which just I had instilled probably just in myself. And I just thought, it, 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 it was looking back, it was quite... Um, it, I've, n- I've never really seen you know, like anyone like that. I'm sure there is, but I've never came across anyone like that. And it was just, it, it was, it was just like I say, relentless. I just, I, I just wanted to to play in that first team, and I, w- I always wanted to be the youngest. You no, know, I just wanted to just try and break records. This was like when Rooney was doing things, and you know, and you, I don't know, it was crazy. And then, like you say, 12, 13, you've got Adidas deals and agents and cl- other clubs, and it was. It was just something actually like kind of took in my stride. I'm quite proud yeah. of the way I kind of handled it as a as a youngster because it was it was a lot to deal with at times. But I had I had great people around us. My parents, especially during those years, were were fantastic. They kind of just sheltered us away from it. I didn't really know too much. I just went and played. Mm. Yeah, well, the Adidas deals they don't really get handed out, do they? So the, you you surely got something about you and that relentless mindset that you had is is really interesting. And when you were saying there around playing in the under 17s when you were 13, 14, how did you find the the intensity and the physicality of the game? Because appreciate your your 13, 14 year old, but when you go up to the 17s, 18, it's one touch football. It's the 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 game's a lot quicker. The physicality is a lot harder. How did you uh, adapt to that? Um, do you know what? It was probably people will tell you, and I'm sure you'll have heard this. When you play with better players, it, it just brings you on. And yeah. 
it kind of took us back to when I started in Middlesbrough, do you know, like being so far behind everyone. Mm. Moving up to the 17s, physically, 13-year-olds can't match a 17-year-old. Do you know what I mean? It's just impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So how I used to manage that was no one's going to get the ball off us. I'm going to play the whole game, one, two, touch. No one's going to get near us. So I, I would work on vision and things like that. And then we had great coaches, unbelievable coaches, like Paul Jenkins, uh, Steve Agnew, those two. Well, obviously Dave Parnaby, like, <clears throat> but Jenks and, and Agus especially, to see at that age, they, it was just non-stop. They would like stay back after training and we'd work on things, we'd work on things, we'd work on things. And then I think it got to like, I was doing that well in the 17s. I ended up playing in the reserves at 14 and it was like, and again, that step up's even bigger. You know what I mean? And it's, again, you've just got to, oh, some things you do, get the people nudging you off, you know, it's it's oh, natural. Yeah, yeah. But, but nine times out of 10, you were you were coming away and people didn't weren't even remembering you as a 14, thinking of you as a 14 year old, you know, it was, so it was, I did what, they, they were great days then. I loved them. And the, the lads I was around as well, like in the, the academy of those year groups they were they were brilliant they kind of just they just treat as like a, their little brother do you know what i mean it was it was brilliant yeah well that time for Borough when you were coming through that between like 2004 2006 is regarded as probably one of Borough's most successful parts of the history really the the youth cup win the carlin cup win the european run the players that were there as well like Borang, Mendieta, Hasselbank, Viduk, Swartz, Southgate you were saying there on the players that obviously playing with better players makes you better. And I, I completely agree with that. Do you think having those players in and around the club brought everyone else's level up because of what they've all done in the game as well? Definitely. I mean, the, the players you've mentioned there, some of them are probably the best players that have played in Middlesbrough's history. You know, I mean, mm. people like Mendieta, do you know, like I, I don't think people actually realise away from Middlesbrough, like actually how good this player was, but not just in terms of ability, but his attitude. He was the first one in, bearing in mind, he'd been signed by Lazio for 30 million and yeah. played for Barca. That's like, I don't know, 150 million these days. Do you know what I mean? It's He was top, top draw. I don't know how Steve Gibson pulled that off and got him there. But um, but honestly, see see for me to, to train alongside players like him, and all the other lads that were that coming through the the years older than me, it was we were just learning all the time. It was like it was like being at school but loving it. Do you know what I mean? It was like you'd go oh, yeah, in absolutely. and you'd see them doing things. You'd see people like Gareth Southgate. You know, he was 35, 34, 35, coming towards the end of his career, and he was another one when he was a player who was he's in in the morning doing his yoga stretching and it. As a young lad, you, you take these things on board. If it's good enough for Southgate and Mendia and people like that, then it's it's more than good enough for us, you know. And I think as young lads, we just we just blossomed underneath underneath that lot. And obviously, we had a a manager in Steve McLaren who yeah. was worked under Sir Alex, who was just wanted the youth to progress, and he was it was incredible. It was he was honestly. The, the way he was with us young lads, he just, he wanted you to thrive and he would, he had no hesitation in throwing you in at any point. Do you know, it was, yeah. if he felt you did well in training, that was it, you were in there. Do you know what I mean? It was, and most of the time, the lads the lads didn't sink, they swam, you know. Yeah, talk to me about the culture with under, under McLaren because you were saying, you were saying there that he worked under Sir Alex Ferguson for many years. Do you think that, do you think that rubbed off him quite a lot and he set quite a lot of high standards and and really delved into that that class of 92 mentality when he when he was at the Mendelsman manager? I think he did. And I think um he was obviously assistant with, with Sven in England. And I think he yeah. thought, well, it did go to plan for him. I think if it, I think he thought if he comes in and does something that the Premier League hadn't done before, play that many young players within a season and and, but also he was successful. So he was successful in doing what he did, obviously winning the Carlin Cup for Borough, getting the UEFA Cup final, you know, like seventh in the league. I mean, Middlesbrough, like, let's be honest, that was, we were... Part of our average. Yeah, of course, of course. But he managed to, <clears throat> as well as having those young players, us young players, he had massive egos, do you know what I mean? You're talking mm. Viduka, 
Hasselbank, Yakubu, Rochenbach, Mendieta, you know, like that's those type players have gone for a hundreds of like a hundred million between them at the time. So it's they were they were massive egos that he was dealing with, um, and he, he got the blend so right, um, and it was a great environment. The experienced players were fantastic with the youth, the coaches knew when to give the the youth a kick up the backside, or also the new just went to, to rest the older ones and give the young ones a chance. It was the blend that he had was was incredible. Um, it was just. For me personally, and I think for a couple of others, it was just such a shame he left at the time he did. I think had he stayed another season for himself as well, I think that that England job came a year too early because um, he tried to obviously then replicate what he did with with Borough with England. But um, I just think had he stayed another year, I think everything could have been different for for a few of us, you know. Yeah, definitely. I think when you when you travel to Southgate getting the job straight away. Mm-hmm. It was probably a difficult move for him as well. And it, he says in his book as well that he was way too young to actually get the job, but he couldn't turn it down. Yeah. And it's, it, do you think that the, the, the club changed with him coming in with Southgate? Um, well, obviously it, it did. I mean, it, it, it did. And it was, to be fair to him, it, I think what, I mean, I'm, I'm probably talking, well, I am talking for someone else yeah but uh, the way I look look at it over the years looking back on it like you said he was I think it was a year too early for McLaren going to England and Southgate getting the job I think had it been another year I think with, with Southgate he found I think it was a difficult transition you know from being captain uh, and then managing all these egos when you're such when you've got no experience as a manager I think it was it was difficult you know and there was just things weren't as smooth as they had been under McLaren. Um, and it was, it was a di- Middlesbrough, we, we did, we went through a, a bit of a difficult period. Um, the first season Southgate was there. Um, it kind of was, a, a, he just, he still played a lot of the experience. He didn't really indulge so much in the youth as much. And then it was, I think he then wanted to get the youth more involved as well. And, but it just, it, it, we we just didn't get it clicking as we had under McLaren, you know. Mm, yeah, you're right. The, the 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 club did change, but and you started to be more integrated into the team under Southgate. But you did make your debut uh, under Steve McLaren, and it was the, it was that game where we had ten homegrown players in there. So talk to me through about your debut because you haven't spoke about it yet. You were saying at the start that you were relentless in getting there, and you eventually did. So how did the call come about and how would it feel to make your debut uh, against Fulham? And do you think that you, you had that, oh, I've completed the game syndrome afterwards? Do you know what? I probably did. I, I, I kind of, you know, when you, you work as a, as a youngster to try and, yeah. like I said, my, my sole aim was to get in that first team as young as I could. Um, and when I did, I mean... I actually was was due. I was supposed to go when we got beat hammered off Arsenal. You know, we got beat hammered off Arsenal right. in the season. I was only sixteen then, um, but I got injured on the Friday, so I didn't go. I was devastated. Um, but so I, chances are, I would have maybe possibly played a couple of games before that. So when I did get in for that Fulham game and everyone was involved, again, when I talk about everything was too much, too young for everyone, I think that was too much, too young for me. Not in terms of the game itself. Because it came on, did did really well, and but it was from that moment I thought, right, because my progression had been twelve year old, thirteen year old, moving up, up and up and up in the age groups. I then thought in my head, I had a right, I should be in this first team every week, and it it what it was never ever a big headedness at all. It was just purely, I'd been so used to always progression, uh, progressing. I couldn't, I didn't know how to deal with leveling off. Do you know what I mean? I, I, like it was, I, like I say, I think had, again, I'm just presuming, or, but I think if McLaren had stayed, I might have played possibly more the next season. But with Southgate, I, to be fair, I got injured. I was out for six months and then went to Bournemouth on loan. And before you know it, that next season's gone. Came back the following pre-season, got injured, was out for six months, went Aberdeen. And then it was the third season of, under Southgate and then played, well, played the 
a few games in the Premier League and stuff. So, but I it was for me, it was I felt it was probably too as much as it was brilliant and I loved it and I look back with great memories. It was probably a bit too much too soon for me mentally. Mm. Yeah, well, it is quite difficult to be fair, man. Like when you 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 what sixteen, seventeen year old, you had those setbacks. You've progressed so quickly, and you've had the Adidas deals. You're playing for England as well at that time, and I'll come to that a little bit later on. But when Southgate did take over, um, and I think Danny, you want to take Josh through this part. Um, he was a club captain at the time. You made your debut. He became the manager. Did he sit down with you and outline? Any plans for the academy for and for you individually when after you've made that debut? Well, he never um, at the time. It was I'd had a meeting with McLaren. And we used to, McLaren and Steve Brown. They used to they used to have chats with me all the time and the, their plans for me the following season. And so I went into this game against Fulham absolutely buzzing and thinking right, this next season's my season. You know, from what they're telling us, I'm going to be doing this that. You know, they were aiming for us to at least get in like 10, 15 games. That, that's what they'd set a target of for me to try and achieve. So then when I've played this game, McLaren's left. I took that quite hard, you know what I mean? Because I thought, oh, no, like, was he just saying that? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're just you're, you're thinking all these things. But t- to be fair to Southgate, the one thing I've, I've always said about him, he's the most honest bloke I've ever met in my life. He's just so upfront and honest with you. Like... I think I went and spoke to him. I still must have been about 17. And I, and I, I think I asked him a question, like, what, like, what, why aren't I involved type thing? You know, a 17 year old, who do I think I was? I should have just been in the training hey, ground doing hey, my work, doing my work and getting It notes. takes guts to do it, though, Josh. It takes guts to do it. I, and I suppose, yeah, but I kind of, I kind of look back and wish I didn't, but I did it. And he just went, Josh, you're not ready at the minute. You're not ready. Um, you, you, we're going to send you to Bournemouth on loan. And the next season, it was, you're still not ready, Josh. Like, you, I don't think you're ready to, to play. Um, and it was at that point in the second season when he'd said that to us, um, where I thought, my days are, it could be, I could be out, actually. Like, I'm, I'm going to Aberdeen on loan. I'm out of contract at the end of the season. Like, at, at 18 year old, I don't know what I'm going to, like, I mean, I'm sure I would, I would have backed myself to get a club, but I'd been a borough all my life. And that's when I got that, that I wouldn't, I, I never lost the desire, but that, whatever it was, that spell came back over is where I thought, I'm not leaving here. I'm not getting, have no one, excuse me, overtake me again. I'm not getting pushed out. I'm going to go to Aberdeen, do well and see what happens. And thankfully I went there, did well, and got a new contract and then, that, that was it, I pushed on again and it was that season that I came back where things just changed for me I got, in the summer, I've come back from Aberdeen, I got a personal trainer over the summer before I went back in pre-season I was the fittest there I was smashing all the records, the bleep test everything, like just competing, competing competing, got took away with the first team, we went to Portugal um, played Celtic um, I think we played Sport in Lisbon as well I can't remember, but I was the only one to play the most minutes when we were out there. And it was in that, that gave us huge confidence again, where I thought I can do this and just just managed to keep progressing again. How would you assess your relationship with Gareth Southgate then? I would say pretty good. Like, I would say good, really good. I've not got a bad word to say about Gareth. He was, I don't think you'll find anyone who does. I think it was just... I think the this, the time at Borough was just too much too soon for a, a lot of people. Do you know that Gareth's proven now he's his man management is fantastic. Do you know like managing the players he's got in England, he's getting the best out of the youth there. I think it was just too much too soon, and he I mean he said that in his book. I think it was too much too soon for me, um, and it was I it was just it was just one of them things. But in terms of personalities and getting on with people Gareth was was one of the best managers I've ever played for in terms of my management it was actually um, what's the word I'm looking for I think because he had, he was such a nice bloke when when you leave somewhere because I'd only ever really experienced McLaren and Southgate 
when I left Borough, I just thought every manager I'll be like him. Do you know what I mean? And it, when you don't come across one who's, uh, you sort of score the end of the, the scale or you then get the next one in at Borough who was the total opposite to Gareth. It's like, that was, wow. Do you know what I mean? You, you took Gareth for granted. And I think probably a lot of people did if they look back, you know. Yeah, you've obviously made your debut when he was club captain and then the, the following season he's the manager. So what was that shift in dynamic like for you as a young player? Um, in, t- in terms of myself, it wasn't really that big of a deal for me. Um, I think it was probably harder for Gareth and maybe the experienced players to, to deal with. I think us as young lads, we were just we were just so focused on trying to get in the team where the, probably the experienced players who were maybe getting left out were thinking, does he like me? Has he ever liked me? It was, do you know what I mean? It was probably, it was probably harder for Gareth to deal with the experienced players than it was the, the younger players. And I, us as younger players, we never really, you know, sometimes you're in a change room and players will talk about a manager. That, that never went on. Do you know, I can honestly say that never went on from the young lads like talking about them. It was just, it was technical. Obviously, a lot of us would have preferred McLaren to have been there that bit longer. But in terms of Gareth, he was absolute top, top bloke. Like, he was so good. He was brilliant with us all. He was just honest all the time. He was just honest. I couldn't say a bad word about him. Is there any elements of his coaching that you saw when he was at Borough that you can kind of see why it's taken him into the England job now? 100%. And I think it's that honesty. I think it's Mm -hmm. the honesty. I think it's... In terms of coaching, <clears throat> um, I can't really remember anything being particularly stand out as if, wow, he was this unbelievable coach and that's what's taken him there. McLaren, you can remember some of the sessions you were doing and you'd come away, you were like, wow, like what was that? That was incredible. Do you know what I mean? With Gareth, I think what's taken him there is his personality. I think... He's honest, and if you watch, you see, if you watch his interviews, every interview he does, you no, know, uh, uh, whoever he was talking to in the training ground, whether it be the the kit man, the tea lady, a player, he looked you in the eye, he listened to every word you said, he'd speak to you, and I think it's that what's taken him as far as it has. Um, I, I think it's obviously he's he's had a great career, um, but I think it's his personality that's taken him taking them that far. Mm. Well, Bournemouth was y- your first stop off on, on the loan spells. I mean, we know how lengthy that journey is and obviously it would have been um, more lengthier for you because you hail from, from Newcastle. Um, I think you were 18 um, when you made that move. W- what was that like for you? Was it quite easy to settle down there? It was, yeah. It was, um, it was, the, I had two choices really. It was either go to Coventry, Coventry won the championship at the time or go to Bournemouth in League One. But the Coventry one, it was... I, I, prob- I didn't know if I was going to play. So the, the club decided that go to Bournemouth, the League One, and, and play. And I was just I was just dying to go and play. I was desperate to go and play football. Uh, being injured pretty much all, most of the season. I was dying to play. Um, and went down there. We had Kevin Bond, who was the manager, who's been assistant with Harry Redknapp. Um, the, Darren Anderton was in midfield. Um, obviously had a great career and the the lads just I just settled in straight away again it was but that was that was the total other end of the scale so you've got Middlesbrough with this amazing training ground amazing facilities I went down to Bournemouth like kind of just because Bournemouth wasn't the club they are now as as they were then you know it was we went down there the assistant manager picked us up from the, the airport took us to a hotel beautiful hotel I was like wow this is brilliant then <clears throat> picked us up in the morning took us to I was like oh we're going to the training ground he's like oh we haven't got a training ground I was like <laughs> I was like oh where are we going and he's like oh he says oh we go to the stadium we get changed to the stadium we'll do a weight session in the stadium and then we will we'll get a minibus or the lads will drive to a school and we'll train at a school and I was like Think to myself, what, what, this, this is, I says, you don't, like, I, I thought, I didn't say how you don't, but I thought, myself, he's winding us up, yeah. But we actually went, and there's lads eating, like, which is, obviously, as you see over the years, but there's lads in the change room eating, like, jam and toast and that, they're reading papers, they're just, like, some of them are, 
no one's getting like some are getting changed some are just chilled like it's people are coming in late and it was like well, what what is what is this the environment you know it was obviously that was that was league one in it but but the lads were brilliant i absolutely loved it you know i played i was there for the, the last month of the season and played all seven games and and helped and contributed to them staying up and it was i think we stayed up with two games to go and it was it was brilliant you know it was a fantastic experience and to be so far away from home um but then the manager kevin bondy was brilliant he was really really good with us he, he understood that i was a young lad living away from home and he was just brilliant the lads were class but i that was the the change in uh, environment was one that i never forgot the first tra training session walking into the stadium and then getting the minibus down to <laughs> to school it was i that was an eye opener but that's that's lower level football you know so that that then made us determined, right? I'm I'm staying at Borough. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I was going to sort of ask because obviously we know what what Rockcliffe is like and the facilities at Borough. Was that complete contrast? Did that just sort of add more? Was it an enriching experience for you to sort of have that difference in environment? Essentially, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was just a, an all round brilliant experience, you know, because you. Obviously, at Middlesbrough at the time, I was treated like an academy reserve team player. I was a 17, 18 year old. When I went to Bournemouth, I was a first team player. You know, so you've got lads who were 16, 17 cleaning my boots, and I'm only six, seven months old, and these kids, you know. <laughs> and it was the job that I was doing at Middlesbrough, they're doing for me. So it was, it was getting used to that. And I'd actually be saying to the lads, no, I'll clean my own boots. Like, do you know what I mean? That was. Um, but like coming away, because normally at Middlesbrough, like if you were in the youth team or reserves, like in the afternoon, you'd be doing gym sessions or you'd be doing you'd be doing something in the afternoon. Where Bournemouth, you you came in, training started at half ten. So as the 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 month went by, and you're becoming more this first team player, and you just then followed the lead of what everyone else does. It started off, I was getting picked up at half eight because I wanted like to get there for quarter past nine. It then became, I'd get picked up at quarter past nine to get there for five to ten. Do you know what I mean? Like just that, it was just, I then became in a bit of a mindset like everyone else. So I'm pleased I was only there a month. As much as I loved it, I came away from it and thought, no, that's not right. Like, do you know what I mean? It was, even though I was never late or anything like that, but it was just, I kind of followed the the pack rather than doing what I'd always done, you know. So, but I, I kind of had to do that, otherwise I would never have got the training. They, that's what time they left, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, well, so but no, I loved it. Yeah, Aberdeen uh, came calling next, and I mean, I have to talk about that game against Bayern Munich. It sort of etched you into cult hero uh, status, I'd say, in, in North East Scotland. Um, but playing against the like Sebastian Schweinsteiger, most of course, the Tony players of that calibre. You must have been pinching yourself as a youngster playing the UEFA Cup as well against the tournament favourites. Oh, it was, it was incredible. You know, it was, it was, um, it, it, it was just a, such a surreal experience. You know, like you were, you, you'd spend a lot of your time as a kid playing FIFA and having <laughs> and having these players. It's like, you know, you you'd beat Bayern Munich or you'd, you'd be Real Madrid playing against Bayern Munich. Do you know what I mean? You. And I just remember walking. It wasn't until I actually walked out of the tunnel against Bayern Munich, come out the dressing room, the lead up to the game, it was just felt like a normal game for me. But it was actually when I came out and you stood next to Van Bommel and you stood next to Luca Toni, absolute giants, Lucio. Like, I, I, like, I thought, my God, these are going to eat me alive. Do you know what I mean? I was this skinny little 18-year-old. And these are just these massive athletes, like, world superstars um and i thought wow you're gonna have to be at it tonight like because if not you're gonna get it. and it was just the oh that was a great experience that game it was fantastic fantastic um and it's one like you say it's, it's held us in high high regard up here um well, certainly in aberdeen anyway and you scored in that game as well so that again must have been the the, the stuff of dreams Oh, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was, it's, it's something that, 
obviously the way my career went with injuries and stuff after, um, it's it's one as much as it was brilliant, it kind of annoys us in a way. Do you know because it's like. God, I did more than that. Do you know what I mean? I did more than just score against Aberdeen. You know, I played for England. I played in the Premier League. And, do you know what I mean? I played in the UEFA Cup. I played abroad in the Champions League and things like that. But it's only that that I really get remembered for. As much as it was a huge highlight in my career, come February the 15th, I get every journalist in Scotland ringing and I just do the same the same interview constantly every year. I actually say it to journalists. I said to them last year. And this year gone, I was like, just just repeat last year. So it's a pointless ringing us. Do you know what I mean? It's like, but but no, I, it was a fantastic, fantastic experience. What a great club and what a what a big club it was. You know, like I I probably didn't anticipate or appreciate how big it was until I got there. You know, like it was just a massive, massive club. But again, that was another one that didn't have a training ground. So. Because I'd had the Bournemouth experience, when I went up to Aberdeen, it just felt, oh, well, I've, I've done this before. So, do you know what I mean? And I was staying closer to the ground. I was in a flat, put us in a flat. So I was able to, to, to do my normal routine, like get into training early and work in the gym and stay back after training rather than thinking I need a lift to get back and all that type of stuff. So I was able to take my Middlesbrough routine to Aberdeen and it was, it was just fantastic. It went great playing Celtic, playing semi-finals of the Scottish Cup and I was it was brilliant. League games, just and again being that first team player in that first team environment. I was still only 18 and it was it was just a great experience. And again that was with some some good quality like experienced players up here who played a lot of games, you know. So it was it was good. I, I loved it, Aberdeen. Really, really loved it. Well, your next two loan spells were Northampton and Rotherham. Did they did they have a training ground? Uh, Northampton, did, no, neither of them did. <laughs> of them did. I think it was. Uh, I know what. No one had a training ground. It was just. I then thought, God, like this is there must be more to football. There must be other loan teams that want me. Like, do you know what I mean? There has to be. But it was. Um, they were they were experiences as well. Like it was the Rotherham one. The Northampton one was unfortunate. I'd only played two games and then dislocated my shoulder in the second game. And went to Rotherham. I'd been injured with a knee injury at Middlesbrough. <clears throat> kind of had a bit of a falling out with uh, Gordon Stratton and he sent us on loan to Rotherham for the last three months of the season. And I was playing with an injury. It was like, an, uh, again, I was playing with a knee injury and it was... I managed to get to, I played the last, all the 15 games I was there. And in the last game of the season, got a bad tackle on us, hurt my ankle. And then I missed the semi-finals of the playoffs in the final, you know. So it was, I played all them games and then missed the, the biggest one. So, but, and then I had to get an operation on my knee. And then that, and then that was, I, there was, I, each loan spell I did had experiences that improved us as a player but also improved us as a person, you know, because you appreciate what you've got. Yeah, you said in an interview a few years back that there were some uh, of the loan clubs that you shouldn't have, have gone to in hindsight. Why was that? See, because I was so desperate. See, this determination that I had as a youngster to want to get in the first team and want to play. My only aim was to play for Middlesbrough. That's all I ever wanted to do. But then when I kind of, I wouldn't say lost my way, but I had to, I, I, I found being patient really difficult because I'd never had to be. Do you know what I mean? It was, I never had to be. It was just constant roller coaster going up. So then when my journey started going up, down, up, down, I found that really, really hard. Um, so then when someone wanted it, someone like say, like for instance, Northampton come in to take you on loan. Like, the season before I played in the first team, I thirty. Well, I think I'd been on the bench over thirty times in Premier League. Played, I don't know, six or seven appearances, and then I'm going to League Two on loan. Like that, just I should have, without sounding arrogant, without sound, I should have been like, no, like. But because I felt wanted, I thought, right, I'm going to go. So whenever someone wanted us, I just would jump at the chance and I kind of force it through and then. 
and it was things like that. And then obviously that didn't work out. I got injured and dislocated my shoulder, and then I'm out. And then someone else comes in from the academy, moves up, and do you know what I mean? You kind of miss miss your turn, and then you you clawing your way back. And it was the the loan spells certainly to Northampton was one that I should never have taken. Just with that, uh, Josh, um, when you see the likes of Phil Ford and now for Manchester City and he's playing at such a high standard and playing with such a, a high performing culture, do you think that would probably would have benefited you more given that you had the mindset that you had if you stuck around at Middlesbrough for probably for maybe one or two more seasons rather than have the loan spells? Definitely. I think I remember when um, obviously Phil Foden was coming through and it did, I mean, obviously he's progressed to, uh, I'd even put him on like world superstar stage That's now. Really, I, think, yeah. I think he's incredible. I think he's, England are so lucky to have a player like that. But I kind of used his journey and I th- like, and looked at my own. Like just, I'm not, like I say, I'm not comparing myself to Phil Foden. I just looked at it in a way when everyone was talking about him, he needs to go on loan, he needs to go on loan. And I would think myself, and I would have chats with your pals as you do about all these players and whatever, and I'd be like, no chance. Why? He's working under a brilliant manager. He's with top players. Like that's, And I just used to say, like, it doesn't always work when you go out on loan. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't always go to plan. Like You're playing in a completely different way with different players, with a different setup, with different... The club's got a different mentality. You've got... Uh, me, personally... As much as the Bournemouth experience was great, the Aberdeen was great, the Northampton not so good, Rotherham, Rotherham good and bad, I would rather have not went to any of those four clubs and stayed at Borough and maybe not have played as many games as I did for other teams, like maybe not as had as many appearances at, say, 20-year-old um, for all these other clubs. But I might have had 10, 15 for Middlesbrough. And those 10, 15 for Middlesbrough might have put me in a total different bracket to then where I... I mean, injuries did, didn't help with that. But I think, if looking back, I would so sacrifice that time at Aberdeen to have stayed at Borough and, yes. and fought me way in and fought and fought and fought. Because as a kid, that's what I was. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, when I started off, I had to fight to, like, Get, get in there I had to fight to stay there where then when I got to where I wanted to be I kind of just let people make decisions for us around us and um, rather than go with my gut of no I'm, I'm it doesn't matter if I'm not playing first team football why would like in league one or league two that's, that's not what I want to be I want to be a Premier League footballer so that that they're things that I look back on and think I wish I'd just listen to myself rather than maybe others around us. Yeah. Well, it's something on the podcast that we've discussed previously around quality and quantity of minutes. Um, I spoke to Craig Lill about it on, on, a, on a previous guest episode and we was, he was saying to his son, Ben, that it was important for him to get out on loan to have as many minutes as possible. So like in your, do you think it's, it's bespoke to the player? So like you feel like the quality of minutes you would have probably got being around Middlesbrough would have been more beneficial for you than, probably having multiple loan spells in different environments, which probably weren't as a high performing culture, which you had. I think so totally. And I think, you know, if you're it, say, say I'd stayed at Middlesbrough and maybe been say, well, at 17, 17, 18, being like, so there was, there was there at the time, Mendieta, Rochenbach, uh, Boateng, and then Catamol. So then, mm. and then, then there was me where if I'd stayed and looked at that and thought we played 4-4-2 at the time, all it takes is an injury. And when I was away, I can't remember what club I was at, a lot of them were injured. And I remember they put Julio Arca from left back in the midfield. Do you know what I mean? And it, it's and obviously Julio went on to do great in there. But if you're in that environment and you're there and you're training how I was training and the attitude I had and how much I would hold my own in training anyway, eventually that that chance was going to come. I mean, it did come, but it took probably two, well, it took two seasons after I'd played my first game to then get in there. Do you know what I mean? So after that had happened, I should have been, 
I should have stayed rather than went on loan. And when I hear people say it's all about minutes, it's all about this, it's that, you need experience of playing in front of crowds. I get that. I do get the crowd thing. But mm. it's not the be all and end all, believe us, it's not. And the amount of the amount of lads that I've played with over the years that have you thought, wow, he's brilliant. And then they get this loan move, it doesn't work out. They go somewhere else, it doesn't work out. And before you know it, people then think he's not even good enough to play in League One, never mind the Premier League. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. and it's just that's football is the opinion of your changes in within the space of a game, you know. So I think for young lads, it's these days it's to be patient um, rather than chasing everything. Well, your chance did come against uh, Sunderland in two thousand nine. Gareth Southgate handed you your first Premier League start. Um, that must have been a, a proud moment for you, especially against Sunderland as well. Oh, it was. Yeah, I mean. I, again, that was. I felt I should have played earlier in the season. I felt in myself, you know, when you know you're doing well. I was playing all the time the reserves, one of the best players in that, and then training with the first team all the time. And I, was, I felt I was one of the best players in training all the time. It was all, always, always, always. And I thought, why? When am I going to get this chance? It, it just took ages to come. And then we had the FA Cup against Barrow, and. That was, I think that was the 3rd of January. It was just straight after New Year. And I played that and did really well. But I still didn't think the following week he would keep us in, even though things had gone well in training again. And then he just, he didn't even, I don't even think he told us actually. I think I was, I knew I was in the squad. Obviously, I knew I was in the squad, but he didn't name the team. So we got there and then and I was starting and I was like, wow, like, yeah, we like, this was, you know, that, 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 dream that you'd always had of starting a Premier League game and it couldn't have been any bigger, you know, against Sunderland and I was like this is this is brilliant <laughs> five minutes in I get my ankle broke, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> so it's um, but it was it was um, I, it was a bit of sweet memories, you know, because it was you'd worked so hard to get there, but again it was um the, as soon, literally as soon as the game finished and well I knew I'd got the injury um, the next day I was in at the training ground with the physios on a Sunday 7 o'clock in the morning till 7 at night and it was just I was like that we meant to be out for 8 weeks I was back within 3 and then he, it was Blackburn the following game well that game that I was back for and he put us straight back in the team I'd only trained on the Friday and I thought God, like, do you know, and, and I felt that went really well. Um, but the time that we were playing, we were just, we were struggling as a, as a team, you know. And I think that another thing for, for young lads is, is a lot of it's about timing. You look back and you think, you know, maybe I played at the start of the season and played when think there's not the pressure, the different kind of pressure, you know, like this. Where when I came into the team, the team was low on confidence. It was no one wanted the ball. It was it wasn't a great environment to to really really be in that, especially in March April time. You know, it was it was a difficult difficult time for everyone. I think. Well, the game that that didn't go well was the West Ham game. The game that uh, eventually sealed Borough's fate. Um, and you played half of that game, and you mentioned there that the sort of spirits were low. Can you describe what the mood was like in the build-up to that game? Was there a sense of inevitability amongst the players that Borough were were down? It, do you know what I think? There was, I think there was. I think there was a, a sense of that even with the coaching staff because I think if I remember rightly, we had to win something like was eight nil or something. Yeah, wasn't it? it was a huge like turnover that, yeah. of goals. Yeah, and we hadn't scored more than three in a game all season. Um, and I think when. I can't remember what the score was at half time. We might have been getting beat one nil or something. And I think at that point, Gareth thought, right, I'm going to have a look at things for next season. And I remember he put me, Joe Bennett, and I think it was Jonathan Franks, if I remember rightly. We just put the three of us on. Um, I think we ended up losing the game two one. Um, yeah. And the, the the whole team put a bit of a, well, put a fight up in the second half. But it was it was it was inevitable that we were going down that day. It wasn't. Um, I think after the game, there was no real anger shown anywhere. It was more just, uh, right, lads, we haven't been good enough. Um, 
and we need to obviously change things in the summer. And, and that was it, you know, and it was, it, that was, that was pretty much it. Obviously the lads on the pitch, all of us on the pitch, we were, especially us young lads who've been there for forever, you know, it was emotional for us because as much as I was from Newcastle and I am a Newcastle fan, I was still a Middlesbrough fan as well. You know, like I wanted Middlesbrough was in my heart. And then when, when we actually, you think, God, we're not in the Premier League anymore. It really sinks, sinks in, you know, it was, it wasn't nice. It wasn't a great experience at all. Um, well, it was a terrible experience, but it's just one of them things. But it was, I would say it was a, inevitable um, mm. what was going to happen that day. Yeah, and then the following season, obviously, Gareth Southgate gets sacked. Um, <laughs> Gordon Strachan comes in. Was it under Gordon Strachan that you picked up that really bad injury that eventually forced you to retire? Yeah, it was. Um, we had a training game. And he just, <laughs> do you know, like when you go from, like I say, with, with Gareth, with Gareth, we had someone who was um great man manager, let's say, like um real honest bloke, real just someone you wanted to do well for and it listened to everything you said, respected who no matter who you were, he respected you. Then you get someone else in who's on the total different end of it, and it was <laughs> let's start putting it politely, you know. It was he just he just didn't he didn't I don't know. I don't know how to describe him. It was without without going over the top. He was just the, the the opposite. And when he came in, there was four or five of us who'd been involved with Gareth, younger lads that he just banished, like didn't even talk to us. I mean, that, that was I think it was me, Joe Bennett, Marvin Emnes, uh, Jonathan Ground. No, it was it Groundsy? Andrew Taylor. So in bearing in mind, Taylor's had played, Taylor's has probably played 100 games in the Premier League by this point. And I remember us four just completely pushed aside. Like he'd, he'd work with the players that were training, like that he'd want in his training session. And us four would be just having shots and a different goal. Do you know what I mean? It was it was, it was terrible. Um, so, but obviously us four worked really, really hard to try and get in there. And I remember we had a, um, reserve reserve against first team at the stadium at the Riverside and obviously I was in the reserve team and Joe Bennett actually had, I don't know why Joe was he put Joe in there at the time but Joe Joe he put Joe in I think someone had gone injured I think he was playing groundsy and then he, he'd moved Joe ahead of tails but to be fair Joe went in and done fantastic and obviously Played, had a great career since but I remember Joe was in the first team at left back the ball was bouncing anyone remembers me I was never a cat and mole type player and like I was I was one that would try and get on the ball and and try and nick past players instead of crunching through players you know and I remember the ball was bouncing I was never going to win it and I have just flew into this tackle to try and impress Stratton and Joe's studs have just gone straight into my kneecap, and my kneecap just just ballooned up. Um, and it was that injury that it wasn't that specific injury, but that injury itself then let off so many different things in my knee, and it's it set off this patella tendonitis, which I could never get rid of. And and I just look back, and I think the thing that kind of hampered my career was a tackle, which I never really did. Do you know what I mean? It was. But um, but I under under Stratton, it was another thing. It was another learning curve. It was putting it politely. <laughs> putting it politely, I, it was frustrating, you know. And he, he, even when it came to leaving Borough, you know, it was frustrating because I I wasn't involved at all. Like I, he took me squad number off as I just wasn't involved. Um, the, the club he was trying, well, the club were trying to get rid of well heat. He wanted rid of a few players, so you knew that the club were trying to get rid of you. And it wasn't until Gary McAllister came in. And Gary McAllister came in and he came and watched the training session that the reserves were having. And I remember he pulled me after and he, and he said to us, he's like, what are you doing over here? And I says, um, well, so this is where I train now. I'm like, do you know, I've been training here a while. And it, next session, I was in with the first team. And when we were in the championship, there was a... 
um, international break and we had obviously a lot of internationals that were going away, but we still had a Carling Cup game and we were away at Chesterfield and I ended up playing in that game. Um, and Ben and mine Stratton had, we'd had, we'd had a couple of fallouts before um, in terms of things. And after the game at, at Chesterfield, he come in the dressing room and he singled me out for pure praise. And even, even the, the older lads in the dressing room kind of looked up because they thought he doesn't really say that. Do you know what I mean? And the next day, so that was say on a Tuesday night, say on a, on the Thursday, I remember being sat in the dressing room and the lads were saying, you'll play on Saturday. Like, do you know what I mean? You're going to play Saturday. You have to. And I was like, oh, well, who knows? Like, just wait and see. And then uh, he had an assistant, Gary Pendry. I don't know if you remember that name. Yeah. Uh, he was he was terrible, mate. That's just like, <laughs> one of the one of the worst guys you could ever have in a football club. Oh my god! But he he come in and he said um, he come in the dressing room. He said, "Josh, the gaffer wants to see you." So I'm there's I'm walking to to see Stratton and thinking he's going to tell us I'm playing. He's going to see how impressed he's been with his preseason and whatever. Because I just really knuckled down, you know. I didn't and. And when I went in, he, he said, Josh, you were fantastic, fantastic on Tuesday. You were doing this, you're doing that. You're seeing things around the corner. Like, it just completely building us up. And then he went, uh, and then he went, but by the way, Watford have come in for you and we're going to let you go. And I was like, why? And he said, and he said, well, we've got a, you can only have a 25 man squad. And because you're 21 now, you fit into that category where you'd I'd have to pick you as a player. Um, and I said, well, you've just been saying how well I've done. Surely you can, surely you're going to like give us a chance now. And he's like, no, I think you need to, I think we need to, you need to leave and get a real sense of um, real football and something, something, something like that. And, and that was it. Um, and so there's me thinking on that Thursday that I was going to play on the Saturday. I was playing for Watford away at home and it was, it was crazy. It was, what was-, it was mental. What was um, Southgate's <laughs> method of, uh, of training like then? Stracken. Who's Stracken on? Stracken, yeah. Stracken. Um, the, I remember, <laughs> like, he, he he didn't like, oh, and, and, I, and I agree with this, I mean, like, he didn't like when, say, you went out on a Saturday night. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't he wasn't a believer in that type of thing. And obviously we had a lot of young lads at the time. And, um, and some of our experienced players like to like to do that as well so oh, um, there's, there's a couple of stop mates to be fair there's a, there's a bar in Middlesbrough uh, I think just above Kalinka's where I would see Nicky Bailey and Scott McDonald every Saturday night when I was 18 <laughs> like. so there's they've definitely been telling him some parkies there mate definitely <laughs> so, I deserve I there was the lads like to the lads like to enjoy themselves um so on a Monday you wouldn't even warm up. He would get, he'd do a, like if you imagine a, a full pitch, so you'd have the corner flag set up at each corner and you'd sprint a line, jog a line and sprint a line. And that that was his way of finding out who'd been out. And I remember Julio, Julio Arc had been out and his first sprint, Julio just pulled his arms. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, that was, that was kind of his method. His method was to really like, try and break you, you know, like we would do, we'd work really hard, and don't get us wrong, I love working hard, love working hard, and I think you, you try and push each other as, as best you can, but you used to do these, like, remember these seven second runs, and you'd, mm. like, you'd sprint for seven seconds, and then you'd just shout stop, and you'd all of a sudden have to slam the brakes on and sprint again, and you did that for ages, and it was like, what are we doing? Like, what we, like, do you know what I mean? And it, I think with with young lads, you can you can do what you want in a way with young lads because they're go- we're going to listen to you. We're going to take everything on board. We're going to do this with experienced players like me. Though that you tell me though, you're doing a seven second sprint and sprinting before warm up. He's saying Dude, like me though's actually saying, "What are you talking to? Do you know what I mean?" And it's like <laughs> it, it uh, Alfonso Alves, people like that. It was it just it just didn't work. He didn't. He just wasn't a people's person. Well, Milo um, did say that he was he was wanting to take over the club just to personally sack Gordon Strachan. Oh. So it kind of... So with well, that in mind... That was the environment. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. had 
it was so split. The dressing room was so mm. split. It was just beyond belief. You know, it was, you had, you had his, and don't get us wrong, these lads were great lads, but they were his crew. They were Stratton's crew and everyone yeah, like, knew that. And then you had the young lads that he liked. You had the young lads that he didn't. You had the experienced lads that absolutely despised Stratton. And it was just, it was just, it was just a kind of toxic in a way. And then you had a manager that 90% of the change room didn't like. Do you know? So it was, and going from Southgate to, to that, it was just, oh, just wasn't, wasn't great. Doomed to fail, I guess. But mm-hmm. you've mentioned, and I think in, in a few of my uh, my questions, we've talked about injuries, and it's a shame that <laughs> there's been so many of them in the in these. Well, in this chat, I'm sure you don't want me to to list the, the injuries that have hampered your career. But why do you think you had such a torrid time with injuries? Um, I think I think in a way it was a little bit of how I played, especially early on in my career. See, when I talk about, I would always try and nick things away from players and I'd try and play things around the corner. Um, the, the the game against Sunderland when I fractured my ankle, that was me instead of probably going through going through Malbron, I've played a ball around the corner and he's he's gone through my ankle. So it was kind of probably the way I played. But in terms of after that, it was that knee injury that happened in that training session, it was just, that just set off so many things after that. Um, so it was, I always found probably from like 20, 20 year old, I found myself playing with, going into games and injured. Do you know what I mean? Playing with an injury at a young age. And then before you know it, you're compensating elsewhere in your body. Um, and it that then gets you injured somewhere else. And, yeah, then hip becomes out of place because your pelvis is out of place, and you know what I mean. And you, it was it just set off so many injuries, and it was just it was just a nightmare. And before you know it, the the game you love, you just didn't love it anymore. Yeah. Final question from me then. Overall, how would you assess your time at Borough? Um, underachieved. That's how I would describe it. Underachieved. Um, I think I was built up from a youngster to to go on and do do really well. Maybe do you know what I mean? Do probably big things in the for the first team, and I didn't do it. Um, again, sometimes other people, but I take responsibility for that because I'm my own person. You know, I, I listen to advice. I listened to everything, but I also took that advice where maybe I shouldn't. I should have been my own person, which I'd been from a young kid. Um, so that's, I, I would say, underachieved. Uh, I loved it. Don't get so like I absolutely loved it. Devastated when I left. I should have stayed longer. Um, but but yeah, underachieved. Picking up on your uh, your post borough career, obviously you just mentioned there about how the the move to Watford came about. Um, and I only mentioned earlier about how kind of as a young player at Borough, you expected managers to be like McLaren and, and Southgate. Uh, Malky Mackay was the Watford manager when you signed, who had a couple of similarities to Southgate, and that he was kind of uh, playing for that club before moving up to manager. Did he mm-hmm. have much of an influence on your decision to join? Do you know, he, it was, again, that was a, a club that I joined. As much as I loved my time at Watford, again, that was me jumping at the first club. Do you know, like, I, I don't think Watford was, well, it wasn't the club for me because they didn't actually need me there, really. They didn't need a midfielder. It was when they, they'd heard that I was available, but... It, they knew I was available for nothing. It wasn't going to cost them anything. So they, they said, well, well, we'll take them on loan. And I'd only trained one training session, and that was on the Friday, um, and done really well in the training session where Malky said, oh, we're going to turn this into a, a permanent deal if you want. So I was like, oh, well, definitely. Do you know? So, But I should have 
been like, no, I'll just go on loan and see how it goes. Do you know what I mean? For that month. Um, and I remember an interview he did when he signed us. He was like, it was, it was like looking a gift horse in the mouth. Yeah, I don't know what the saying is. Something like gift. I can't remember what the saying was, but when I found out what the saying was, it was like, it meant we didn't need him, but it was something we couldn't really turn down. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, God, what have I done? Do you know what I mean? But in, the, in that, I think I played, I was involved in the first six or seven games. And then after that, it was just a bat on the bench um, and then back on loan. And it, that was, I still see Malky. Mal, I still see Malky in Edinburgh because uh, he's up here. Great bloke, a lot of time for him. Um, but I just, I don't think Watford maybe was the right club for me at that time to to go from Middlesbrough to, to Watford. I had, I had possibility of going to Swans, Swansea with Brendan Rodgers. Um, and when I look look back, I think maybe I, that might have blossomed under him. You never know. You do these things, you know. So it's just one of them things. But I, I loved my time at Watford. And again, that was a great experience and a great club to be involved at. You mentioned there, though, kind of treating you as kind of a, a luxury player, like, you know, you were available and, and they kind of had to have you. You made four appearances for them kind of off the bench and then went to Stevenage, Northampton, Scunthorpe on loan, kind of getting back into the, the loan spells. After kind of years of, of, of those kinds of loan spells and the injuries, was it important to try and get the uh, consistency of games under your belt? It, it was, it was, it was... Um... It wasn't until I went to Scunthorpe um, with Alan Nil where I thought I'm getting my career kind of back on track. I'd managed to, when I went on loan there, played 16, 17 games, finished as the top assists, I'd scored three goals. <clears throat> I was just doing really, really well. Um, and it was that summer that I came back where I was looking to push on. We played Middlesbrough actually in pre-season. Um, and we beat Middlesbrough 3-2, I scored against them, and I come away from that game and I thought, right, I'm kind of back now, I felt great, and then the knee injury, it came back, we played Derby, first game of the season, in the Carlin Cup game, when we drew 5-5 five, five and beat them on penalties, and after the game, my knee was just in pure pain, and it was the pain that I hadn't experienced before, and before you know it, I had this injury that just I couldn't get rid of. It was um, a 24-year-old and it was, no, well, 23. And I, I just couldn't get rid of it. We tried everything. We tried absolutely everything. That The club were brilliant with us at Scunthorpe. And then it, like a 23, 24-year-old, I, I wasn't even fit enough to train. You know, I train one day a week and play Saturday, be in pain, getting injections before a game, be in pain after the game. And it was, before you know it, then you couldn't run, you couldn't, you're going into games and you can't even turn. Do you know what I mean? You can't turn the way you do. You're thinking of how you play in your head. And it, it just became the most frustrating part of my life. It actually became a bit... It was so hard mentally to deal with. Like, mentally, was was a, it was between the ages of 23 and 25. Oh, my God, it was mentally... It was a terrible, terrible time in my life. Um and it wasn't until I went to India where I thought this is this is an, I needed an opportunity just to be away from it, everything and see what I could do. Um, I thought maybe playing playing in the heat and everything like that. You no, know, and you just think the different things that could maybe save your career. Um, and in a way, it did uh, because the we I got so lucky when I when we went across to India, um, Bangalore. The um, the season got postponed by six months, so we um, we had I had six months to try and get myself in shape. Not in terms of fitness level, but my knee and some kind of um, strength, fitness. I don't know what what the word is I'm looking for, but get my knee in some kind of stability where I could play football again to the level that I once did, and I did that. But then when the season started again, by the time it was coming towards the end of that season, I remember playing the last game of the season and I was in absolutely agony. And I knew I needed another contract because <laughs> otherwise what was I going to do? I managed to get another contract, but that was it. I never played a game of football after that. I mean, 
going to, to India, it's obviously a bit of an unusual career path. Uh, I think we're, we're only now really seeing the uh, English players going to, to Germany uh, and France, etc. Did you have any kind of hesitations about moving there? Um, and obviously, uh, John Johnson, who, who was at Borough, uh, was there as well. Did you kind of speak to him much about the move? Yeah, it was um, it was actually John who actually got me the move. Um, John John is probably my best friend in football. We've been together at Middlesbrough since eight year old. And when John went out to India, um, obviously kept in touch with him and spoke to him, and and he knew what was happening with me back home, and um, and he he said that they needed a midfielder over there. And you know what it's like when people say this, you just think that they're just being nice, and now it's going to happen. Um, before I knew it, um, I was meeting the manager, Ashley Westwood, um, down in Northampton um, and agreeing a contract to go to India within the space of a week. It was, it was surreal how it happened. Um, but I was, it, was, it was down to John, really, how I, how I got out there. Um, but that was, that was a real, real life experience as much as football. But the life experience was fantastic over there. It's great. Well, just to go a little bit into that, then um, obviously there's there's going to be a, a big culture change in, in terms of your your life experience, but also the the football. Was the the standard there completely different? How do you kind of adapt to, to living over there? Uh, the standard was a lot better than what I thought it was ever going to be. In my head, I thought it was going to be like school football. Do you know where you take the ball, and you dribble past everyone, and you score? And that's what I thought it was going to be like. I've never heard of anyone play football in India. I've never heard of nothing about it. Um, John had said it's better than what you, you know, what you've probably got in your head, but still, I never thought it would be as good as what it was. But it was brilliant. It was it was really good, and it was probably the level of football that I needed. Um, I probably wasn't fit enough to ever play at the level I'd once played before, but it was probably the highest I could have probably played, if that makes sense, um, with the injuries. And it was everything just went went great. It was probably about I would say. League One, League Two, England type football, but it minus the Route One, everyone tried to play. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the majority of teams tried to play, um, but it was it was great. Loved it. Um, but again, in terms of life experience, real eye opener, you know, because when 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 I used to think I was down about an injury, you know, you're going out there and you've got kids living on the street, and it it just put it put my whole life, what I'd experienced in the last couple of, in the, in the couple of years previous, where I'm thinking I'm down about stuff. I then started, to, I then started to come out of that and think, I'm, God, I'm so lucky to, to to have what I've got, you know. When these are, these have got nothing, some of the the people out there. Um, but no, I was, I loved it, loved it, really, really good memories from from Bangalore. Uh, you moved back to the UK after that. Uh, you were a free agent at the time. Did you ever kind of fall out, out of love with football at that point? Well, what happened was when I was out there, I signed a, um, I signed a contract at the end of that season, another year to stay. Um, and again, the season wasn't going to start until the January. Um, so... Well, manager Ashley Westwood had said to me and John, if you can train with a club back home, then you don't have to come back out here until November, um, November, December for pre-season. So I was living in Edinburgh. My, my partner at the time and uh, my, my children were, were in Edinburgh. So an agent got us training with Hibs. So I went in training with Hibs. Um, trained, but I was... Again, this was stupid. I was training with Hibs, looking to try and get a contract there for when my contract in India finished at the end of the next season. So I'd be training in pain and I would just, without them knowing, I'd be training and I'd be icing my knee. But I was making myself worse. And I, little did I know I was actually finishing off my career because then when I went back to India in the November, I think we were two, three training sessions in, the, the tendon on my patella just snapped and it was, that was it. That was, that was me. And it was my career. Well, professional career was done. The the doctors over there were like, you'll, you'll not play again. This, this won't heal. You've had four, I think I'd had four operations at the time 
in four years. It, they just said it's it's not going to heal to the level you want it to, and and that was it. I I was then out of football for about oh well at least a year um, of that season, six months of the next season, um, and it wasn't until when I came back from from India where I thought I need to do something else with my life because football's finished now, um, and that's when things started to hit home and I thought, God, what have I done? And you then go down a bit of a slippery path again. And it was, it wasn't great again, but it was, I managed to deal with it a lot quicker and a lot better than what I, what I had done before. I think because I'd, I'd had the injury for so long. Um, I then started um, doing a job. My mate's a, a builder, he's own building firm. So I, I went and just, I just needed to do something. And so I went and did some labouring work for him. And it was while I was doing that, I thought, surely if I can do this, I could play part-time football again. So about 18 months later, um, I'd, I'd get myself fit. I'd got a PT, got myself fit, got a physio and signed with Edinburgh for, for well, I think it was three-year contract I signed there just to play part-time football. But again, it was... I could never, I was in pain all the time. It was, and I was only training twice a week, um, training twice a week, icing my knee on the way back from training, icing my knee on the way to games and playing part-time football. Again, no disrespect. It was, you're playing against lads who you know in your head are nowhere near to the level you once were, but that, that was the thing. I wasn't the player I once was. Do you know what I mean? So I, I just, mentally I was like I can't do this and physically I was just nowhere near it you know so I eventually packed in was it last summer two summers ago um like completely from from that part-time environment as well it was just physically it was too much the demands on it were too much it was um I couldn't I couldn't do it so mo- moving into to caution and just kind of uh, like you say, kind of calling it a day. There, how how do you manage to, to cope with that mentally? At uh, kind of such a such a young age. Uh, what moving into coaching? Um, yeah, and well, and, and retirement, I, I suppose. Oh, the, it, do you know what the when I actually retired from from football in, in my head, I retired from football when I left Bangalore. Um, I didn't anticipate that I'd ever go back in. I was told by doctors I wouldn't be fit enough to do it. So that was at 26. By the time I was 28, I got offered a three-year contract at Edinburgh part-time. I thought, I'll take this. So I took that. Um, but I knew a few months down the line after that, that it was just the injury was coming back again. It was just more, worse and worse and worse. And it got to the point where when I actually announced my retirement. I remember announcing it in front of the lads and I'd spoke to the manager at Edinburgh before. Um, I just said, I can't do this anymore. It was real emotional because obviously I was, you think back, you, you've worked your whole life pretty much from eight year old and you're then calling it a day. That was a real emotional point. However, the next day was the biggest relief I've ever had in my life. Do you know, it was, I was actually so pleased. It was like a deep, breath it was like just just leave it behind you know and I could I could walk away from it and you then start getting people reminding you of the good things you did in football and and then you look back and I just had no negative thoughts towards towards football anymore because I'd left it behind and football it gives a great great start in life um with everything really like and it was it was just a chapter of my life you were closing the book on, you know, and to then be lucky enough to, well, I decided to to, to go into coaching and I, f- I think with the coaching school that I've got set up, Academy, it's um, as much as it's to help people, or help kids play football, it's also because the experience I've gone through as a, as a player and as a person through football, it's something totally different to what what what's up here, you know. So it goes really well. How, had you always kind of planned to to stay in football and, and do coaching after you'd retired? Do you know I was I was one of the I was one of the majority of players when you play, you think 
and everyone says you should do something alongside it. I was one of the ones. Oh, I'll just do it when I finish. Do you know what I mean? I'll, I'll just. No, I'm not going to college. Why would I go to college? I'm not doing that. I'd rather go home and go to sleep in the afternoon. Do you know what I mean? And things like that. The majority of footballers are like that. However, I never anticipated that football would end so suddenly. <laughs> and so when it does, and you've got nothing behind you in terms of education or something alongside it. I'd never even thought about coaching. I'd never really, I'd never done any coaching badges either, which is stupid. Like we, yeah, I should have done, in a way, I think footballers should be forced <laughs> to get something behind them because unless footballers are forced to do something, they don't do it because everything's done for you. So I think you've got to be forced to do something. Um, but uh, when it, in hindsight, when things did actually like come to a complete end and you've got to then do something to, to support your family, uh, the best option I thought for me was to stay in football, try and start something. Um, and it, I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough, that, but I also think going back to me as a kid and that determination to be a footballer, the determination now is to, to help others. And I, uh, and when you when you think why was it that uh, when you when you're asking the question why was it or you think I got injured I'm a big believer and I think things happen for a reason I think my reason why I got injured was to help others and help others be in the like on stay on the right track and on the right path and give advice I get players from from all kinds of clubs that I've played with call us now and ask for advice and ask for and I, and I love that part of it, you know, and I love helping kids. I love helping, I love helping anyone that needs a bit of help. Do you know what I mean? Because I think over the years I was given so much rubbish advice um, and I took that advice. I, I think I can use my own, I'm not saying I'm right about everything because I'm not, I'm, and that's not what I'm trying to say here, but what I'm trying to say is because I've been through it, I think people understand that and people listen to what I've got to say. Um, and that's, that's, I'm not the best coach in the world. There's no, I'm not Guardiola. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, but I'm a coach that I use my experience from what I've gone through um, from not just a, a technical aspect, but from a, a whole life aspect. I bring that into the coaching academy that I've got and it's, been brilliant you know it's been brilliant i can't have any any complaints at all yeah it's, it's all... In... sorry tom go on. Sorry, i was just gonna say did, did that all really um kind of help with the, the transition into coach and then because i know you had a, a role as uh, assistant manager at tron and juniors um obviously ended suddenly but you've kind of got all that experience behind you did, did that just kind of help with the the transition into that well that was the the trinent one was a um I, ha I had my well my coaching academy for forward coaching and I'd always just worked with kids from, well, in that academy, it's from five to, I think, the eldest that the coach is 18. So I, had, I hadn't been involved in a first team in terms of coaching. So up here, this, you, you have like your League One, your League Two, and then it goes to um, Lowland and Highland, and then it's like junior football below that. So the junior football... Um, there's a team called Trenent, which is probably one of the biggest clubs in that environment. They'd asked us to go in as a player assistant. Um, this was before uh, the COVID. This was, I think, it was in the January, so before COVID, and or January, February, before COVID, we knew existed. Um, I went in there, and I found that tough. I found that tough in terms of being a player and taking the session and running in a my coaching school and senior kids and just it was when people think part-time football is easy like it'll be easier part-time football is actually so much harder than full-time football because you have to manage so many different parts of your life where when you're just a full-time footballer that's all you do do you know what I mean everything else is done for you where when you're part-time it's just a job it's just and then you've got other jobs and you've got other parts of your life and it was just it, it was too much to handle. I got 
<laughs> I'm not saying I got lucky because of COVID, because COVID's been the worst thing that could happen to the world. But in terms of me, it gave me that route out of it where I didn't have to make a big fuss about leaving or, or whatever. It was just you know, COVID's happened. So I mean, it's best that I walk away from it, you know, um, and concentrate on my own stuff. It was just too much to try and take on. But I'm glad I did it because I got to see what men's football is like from a different side from that management side and you see from the, the amount of rubbish that the manager had to deal with it, from players and from committees and from s- staff members and it was like oh, it was it, it was a lot to deal with um so i don't know I, I don't know what the, i always used to think that management that i wanted to be a manager now i think why would I want to put myself in that? So I, I, I'm not I'm not ruling anything in or out in terms of what I want to do going forward because um, I'm so open-minded to what comes about. Um, but I'm just so focused on helping helping kids. Do you know what I mean? If I if I can help kids, um, and not just in academies, but the kids that just want to play football that or maybe have got problems going on in their life and they see football as that bit of an escape route escape route out of it that's what I that's how I kind of see my coaching academy it's it's a it's an all-round thing where yeah we're there to develop footballers but I want to develop the person as well do you know what I mean in terms of just advice help and um that's kind of how I see it going yeah, as, as we come at the closing questions now, um, we have like four of them, which we ask every single guest, but it's it's lovely how your stories came full circle with how you grew up, grew up as a kid, really, and how your parents were of you and what you're doing now is essentially what your parents did to you when you were growing up. So it's 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 quite wonderful and how it all went full circle in a way, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's right. I, it's, uh, it, has, it has gone full circle. It, it has, but let's 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 put the closing questions in. Uh, so, look, looking back at your career in football, what's the one thing that you're proud of the most? The probably the the proudest thing. The, there's the, the, I've got I have got so many, and to to name one is really difficult. But probably the one that I'll go for is is playing the Premier League, do you know, like, I just dreamt of that as a kid. I mean, I dreamt of playing for England and all that type of stuff, and I was fortunate enough to do that for the youth teams, but I never did that at full level. To play in the Premier League at 17 at Fulham was just, just, I can't tell you how, how that made me feel, my family, everything. It was just everything I'd worked for. So when I look back and I think maybe things didn't go to plan or how people expected my career to go, well, I still did a hell of a lot more than what the majority do. Do you know what I mean? Not many get to play in the Premier League at mm-hmm. 17. Do you know what I mean? I, so that, that's the proudest moment for me. To be honest, Josh, when you were saying earlier around underachieving and, 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 and all that kind of stuff, I, I probably disagree with with your career, to be honest. And to say that you've played in what the Premier League, you're for cup, you've captain your country at a youth level. That I don't, I don't think that's underachieving at all. I think if anything, that's very successful. So, do you think that your perception should probably change for that? Uh, well, that that is nice to hear. I think it's just the way I always looked on the vision I had for my career didn't didn't go the way the way it did. Do you know, so when I look at it, um, maybe to say underachieved, to the, not the right word, but in a way, I, I still do look at it in that sense because my dream was, my vision was to play for Middlesbrough, to play in the first team, play in the Premier League for years and years and years. So because I didn't do that, I, I, I look at it as an underachievement because what, people set out what people thought I would do but like you say from another side when you look at it on a different point of view well you, I played in the Premier League I played for England I played in the World Cup scored new UEFA Cup like so I uh, maybe that that is the wrong word but because I was so determined and vision tunnel vision on what I wanted 
But when I take a step back, you're probably right. It's probably, it's it's a lot better than what I probably give myself credit for. I was going to say, you you, sh- you really should, to be honest. You really yeah. should. I think you've had, a, you've had a cracking career, but if you could restart it all over again and just, is there anything that you would change at all? Yeah, the, the, the one thing that stands out in my is I wouldn't have went in for that tackle in tackle. training. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, um, but also, I would have been patient. I would have just, when I played that game at Fulham, came away and, you know, if it took us another three years to get in the first team, so be it. I would only been 20. But because I was so young and I just wanted to keep progression, I, I just I started then chasing everything rather than realising that I was a good player and my time would come. So any advice I can give to anyone in a, the, the, the kids, boys and girls I give advice to up here is be patient. Hmm. You know what I mean? Just yeah. that's what I would have been. I would have been patient. Yeah, it's that saying with be rigid with your goals, but be flexible on how you get there. And I think that is kind of the case with, with you. If it was just that little bit of patience here and there, it might have just could have maybe yeah. changed uh, could have changed anything to be honest but when you when, when you when you do say patience I, I do think that it's it's a valuable skill to have but I think that relentlessness and that drive and that real passion to get through your career is I think it's very admirable um to be honest with you Josh but then what the one final question we've got um and this is this is probably the most difficult question I'm going to ask you is um from the players you've played with uh, what is your overall, what is your actual five-a-side team from the players that you play with? Who would you pick? You can have two subs, to be fair. You can have two subs, but don't follow okay. the trap, which right, uh, which, yeah. Lids, which Lids did, where Lids picked, picked eight, where he picked six out of the players. So, <laughs> um, uh, who's that, Gary Little? Uh, Craig Little. Craig Little. Oh, Craig Little. Craig Little. I, um, I would go for oh, the goalkeepers I've played with. It would have to be Mark Schwarter. Um if we're playing in five side, you just fill the goal anyway. But yeah, short it slide down, yeah. Uh, what a what a keeper he was. He was he was brilliant, and he was in probably that most successful period in Middlesbrough's well history, really. I, I'd say it has to, has to be him. Um, I think. So what am I going if we're playing a five side team? I go one defender and three. Mid, I don't know. I'll go one defender. We'll go all out attack, uh, mm-hmm. defensive wise. Um, again, probably someone who was. I'd, I'd go with Southgate. I'd go with Southgate. Um, Woodgate was probably the best I ever seen, but I, I didn't get to play with him. Um, I'll, I'll get to train with him that much. Woodgate never trained. He was one that never ever trained really. So I never really got to see Woodgate apart from when he turned up on a Saturday, and he was just man the match. But Southgate was was brilliant. Um, and he was he would be the the, the captain in that team, uh, just the one that just led by example and everything he did. But was also a very very good player. I either thought you could pass it out from the back. I'd have Southgate in there, midfielders, Mendieta. Um, by far the I'm going to say, in my opinion, the best player Middlesbrough have ever had, um, other than Janino. Um, but I never got to play with Janino. It was before my time. But uh, in my time, Mendia was just incredible. And technique, um, attitude, drive, determination, role model. One, you could ask advice. Would If he didn't play, he'd ask to play in the reserves. You know, like he was just, just a manager's dream. I don't know what happened, why... There must, for me, we all think there must have been something in his contract. If he played another game, he must have got mm. something else. Do you know? Because he was just, he was just incredible. What an incredible person, but player. Oh my God! Like you have no idea. It, but there was a spell at Middlesbrough under Southgate where Mendia just was kind of frozen out in a way, um, and. They always used to let us pick our own teams in training, like not for like six aside tournaments yeah. or whatever. Mendy was first picked by everyone. Do you know what I mean? Like they were fighting <laughs> over him. Like so, it was uh, it showed how much he was thought of by the players. So I'd have Mendy in there. I'd have Stewie Downing, 
bombing up and down the, the left left wing back in that five or eight team. He was Stewie was one that um I didn't realise how good he was till I played with him. Um yeah. and I thought and people thought I was good off either foot. Stewie was incredible. Like I couldn't believe how good he was with his right foot. He was just I thought, oh my God, I thought I was all right with both feet. He's a disgrace how good he is. He could just move the ball side to side and switch the plane. I think he was another one who Middlesbrough, probably the fans didn't realise how good he was till he left. Um, and you appreciate what, what a player he was. So Stewie, um, how many players has that have I got in there? Got Swartz, uh, Southgate, Mendieta and Downing. So we've got one more. So my striker, I'm going with. This is a tough one because uh, when I was there, um, Yakubu was one that kind of took me under his wing. He just looked after me brilliantly. Um, I loved Yak. Um, Jimmy Hasselbank, he was he was brilliant player. Um, but the one I'd have to go for for Viduga. He was the most chilled guy ever. And if you're playing in a five-a-side team, you want someone who's going to stay up the pitch and Dukes definitely isn't going to track back. So he would just be, he'd be up there, but his first touch is just... Majestic. Oh, he was. He was phenomenal player. Absolutely. <laughs> when you talk about Mendieta, like first one in, last one out. Dukes was last one in, first one out. He was the total opposite. <laughs> like... He was just so chilled. He'd come in, and even when he was, he was never late, but he'd come into training and be sat in the change room. Everyone's getting dressed. He sat there with his paper, drinking his cup of tea in the change room, just chilling. He's like, what, what he's rushing for? Do you know what I mean? Just as if time stood still for him. Um, but ability-wise, he was incredible. And, and another another great guy. So it was, um, that, that would be, that would be my five side team. Do you want any subs or are you are good with a five? Sub wise, um you need someone who could come on and change a game. Um if do you know one one that I'd have to pick because again he was brilliant with me. He was also one that goes down in legendary status because of the UEFA Cup. It's gotta be Massimo. Massimo was just um, he, he was a real, real good, good lad. But he was, he was such a good player, real hard worker, um, fantastic. Another chilled guy as well. Like we had such a chilled change room, it was unbelievable. <laughs> um, I'd have, I'd have Massimo, and I'd have Julio. I'd have Julio in there okay. because uh, Julio, Julio had the whole package. Julio was a great player, a great. Um, great attitude, great worker, loved the night out, was was there, everything, organised and everything. Anything that happened, Julio saw it. He was just, he just loved it. And he was there. Uh, he was just a oh, great, great guy. I got on so well with him. That would be my five-a-side team. And if, aye, I'd, I'll, I'll stick with that seven because I could pick so many yeah. more. But just overall, I think with that, that seven players, we'd, we'd do all right. Yeah, I think you would as well. And to wrap up, uh, wrap up on Julio Arc, we had a fantastic drag back as well. So oh, um... he, he could meg you for fun. He just megged everyone for fun in training. Um, brilliant, brilliant player. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Brilliant lad. But Josh, that's it, mate. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. I really enjoyed that chat and, and getting to know your, your career. I think your, your mindset in, in football is brilliant. It, it reminded me of a book called Relentless by Tim Grover, who is... Mike was Michael Jordan's coach. So if you ever get a chance to read that book or an audio book, I would highly recommend it because I feel like you would, you'd have so many parallels to what he tries to coach. It's uh, it's my one probably big recommendation for that. But yeah, yeah. It, I would give it a read if you want to. But I wish you all yeah. the best with your coaching academy. Um, you're based in Edinburgh now, right? I am, yes, based in Edinburgh now, yeah. Well, I, I'm there in a couple of weeks. So if I do see you, I'll, I'll uh, buy you a drink and gilly do. So um, I right, drop us a message when you're coming up. Yeah, I will, will do, mate. Um, but great speech here, mate. I hope you reach as high as you possibly can with your coaching career and whatever you want to do. But for now, this has been the Bora Breakdown podcast and that was all your match day chatter in a pod. <laughs>